It's a good move in the right direction as an intervention from the South African Dep Department of Trade and Industry. I think that Rob Davis has the right vision and, and that he's continuing in the foundations that were built by the previous ministers 10 years ago, but more so focused now on black aspirin filmmakers uh, because of the fact that you now need a director and a producer to apply for the emerging black filmmakers film incentive for the first 600,000 spend, you get a 50% rebate. Now that just, it's like a, a, you know, it's like a shot of steroid for the, for the industry. But also, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, room for improvement in regards to uh, distribution as well. Because now you have all these films that are going to be proliferating over the next three to five years uh, in the South African film industry. But there needs to be an infrastructure and a system for distribution too. Okay, now you spoke about room to improve. Do you have anything to say on that, Catherine? Do you think there is room to improve? And if so, what would that be? Uh, the Emerging Black, Black Filmmakers Incentive and from the DTI and the fund launched, uh, the Emerging Black Filmmakers Fund launched by the IDC and NFEF are great initiatives. They address something that, that really, really, really needed to be addressed. Um, I, I might have an issue with the word emerging because uh, I don't know what the number of films, I think, uh, many, many experienced filmmakers qualify for those grants. And I, I, I'm not impressed by calling them emerging. But a black filmmaker is something that enables black filmmakers to make films. I think it's amazing, and I'm looking forward to that. I also think that they need to be combined with, um, with um, innovation and, and, and courage when it comes to distribution. It's hard to make movies, and movies generally are too expensive. And if you've got a story, and it doesn't matter, it might be me or it might be a kid out of Newtown Film School or whatever, um, it, it makes it much more um, graspable to do. But the point, and, and we wouldn't be, you wouldn't be having a TV program like this if it wasn't for the DTI. There wouldn't be a boom in the South African film industry. We wouldn't be making better and better movies or feeling more proud of ourselves if it wasn't for the DTI. But the problem and the big mess up in fact, put any expletive that you like in it. The big, okay, is distribution. The Stokinicals, the new metros, and even the broadcasters. Because these movies don't get seen. And the, the, so the, so the, the kind of weird irony or paradox, whatever it is, is that the DTR are not protecting their own investments. They're creating this wonderful industry. And we are really telling greater, better, better, better stories. And, and we're creating stars. But people aren't going to see the movies, okay? or they're getting pirated. Or in the case of my film, Durban Poison, the executive producers don't want to spend the 250,000 rand it costs to distribute a movie, because they think they're going to lose money. So they'll just send it straight to DVD. So the, the DTI should be protecting their own interests. There should be some kind of clause. This is the improvement that mm. Timber is talking about, no. where uh, there is a, every film that the DTI puts money into and supports is guaranteed a one-week release on four screens. I get your point, Andrew, but also I think there's a cultural issue here, too. With the proliferation of pay cable, uh, piracy, and so forth, you know, now you can just download a film illegally and put on a memory stick. There's also a cultural thing that's happening where, you know, I'm not going to spend if I'm, you know, I'm going out and taking out my girlfriend in the, in the location, and you tell me it's for two tickets, it's 110 rand, then it's petrol, then it's popcorn. You're talking about 250 rand in one yeah. night. And whereas, you know, I can go and get that DVD on the corner from that guy who just, you know, pirated it for 10 rand. Yeah. It becomes a choice. So that also is a, is a, is a problem right there is because you, you're fighting a proliferation of what, you know, multi-choice is giving and DSTV is giving towards people uh, in, in, in households as far as VOD. BOD is now becoming popular. So, so you can also download legally. Yeah, yeah. you can download legally, mm. but those are the things. Those are the things that you also have to contest with, other than the traditional form of distribution. So we also need to rethink about the additional form of, re of distribution within South African cinema, because globally that is changing. Yeah, it's changing it's at, a, at a rapid uh, uh, pace, where now people are rethinking about how they can distribute their films. Uh, collapsed windows where you know you release on a theatrical and you release on a VOD and you release yeah. on free to air or you release on pay cable. Those things are actually happening right now. It's just that where South Africa is as an emerging economy, we have not really caught up. 
So filmmakers also, the onus is on them. As much as we have constraints within government and, and what the DTI can do, it's a leg up. But at the same time, we have to be proactive and say, what are the trends out there? What do I need to do as a filmmaker to make sure that I look at the innovative ways and the cost-effective ways to get my film out there? Apart from distribution, there's also the, uh, the thought that our stories are not basically gathering an audience. Um, because we're obviously inundated with American cinema. So we know American blockbusters coming out. People flock towards that. How do we get our stories? Should we improve our stories? How do we get our stories out to people? Can I say that's, that's yeah. I don't believe that at all. I, I co-program First I Wednesday disagree. Film Club, <laughs> uh, and we often show South African movies. And every month, we have 250 people coming. Um, you know, I'm going to quote Ramadan Suleiman, a filmmaker, who said that you actually have to, to work. You build brands, and like people didn't just wake up one morning and love Coca-Cola the day Coca-Cola was invented. Mm. Like, it took years, years, years to build a culture of Coca-Cola. For us to see the sign and wanted to drink Coca-Cola, you actually, you build audience over time, mm. and you do it purposefully and with determination. You do, don't let one story or one film be the be-all and end-all of everything. Mm. So every story, every film that has been made deserves, deserves to be there. And some South Africans need to be helped to appreciate their own cinema. But it goes back to yes, Andrew's point. I agree point with Catherine, yeah. and I think that it, that is a, mm. that is happening. Mm. You know, if you say ten years ago South Africans wouldn't actually even want to see their own movies. Mm. Now you look at a movie like Hard to Get that's been playing for four months, mm. it's still on in the three screens now, and that's wonderful. Mm. Um, and I think we are changing the types of stories we tell. So for a lot of times, you know, South African cinema has been the gangster movie, you know, which is Totsi, Jerusalem, or to get in fact, on number number, um, uh, four corners, and, and then the Afrikaans comedy in the Karoo where they find God and each other type thing. Um, and now we're sort of moving away from that. So um, Akino Matoso has got a film called uh, Tell Me Sweet Something that's coming out next year that's a romantic comedy. Uh, set in Mabane in, in Joburg, it's like it's hip, whatever it's now. Um, the, the film that won Best South African Film in Durban this year was called Love the One You Love by Jenna Bass, set in Cape Town, and that was about relationships and very universal movie that was quite charming and sort of winsome <coughs> and in its own s small way magical. Um, so I th again, it, it takes time, and it's and and. Again, going back to the distribution point, if we if we could get these movies out there, so we know, it, and it's locked in by the DTI, so it means that even if it flops, it's out there. Then we're creating this consciousness, and and it's it's like how big the garden is. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Basically, it goes hand in hand with the marketing. You have to be innovative in how you market your product to your audience as well. So, the marketing is going to be is going to be key, and you need to look at that at the beginning, of even before you shoot your first frame. How am I going to market it to my audience? And who is my audience? And then basically look towards saying, OK, I'm going to break down the conventional ways. But what's the best way of me to reach my audience? So you have to think uh, in a very innovative way and think, uh, what is the best way to get that product out to my audience? So between the distribution platform and the marketing, because you can have the distribution, but if you're not marketing it, then it's just you're, you're kind of dead in the water. I'm afraid of two things. I'm afraid of. Uh, 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 um like what you said, we're moving from gangster, we're moving to that. I, I, yeah. I, I, again, I, I can't stress diversity. I don't think we're moving from something to something. Mm. I think some things are added. Yeah. I think yeah. Yeah. now they're going to be gangster films and love films and yeah. films mm. about human resources right. managers. You know, yeah. like yes. they're going to be mm. a, a diversity of them. And I, what, uh, sorry, about what you were saying, I also think, I think it's dangerous also to try to please. I mean, Everybody. you want to please everyone and you end up uh, pleasing that's no not one. What I'm s that's okay. not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying you need to find, identify your audience. If it's a rom-com, you know that, okay, fine, what is the market out there for yeah. rom-com? Mm. What is the market I'm going to... There's, there's no way you can please everyone. I mean, there's going to be distributors who only do rom-coms and only do horror flicks, mm. so you can't go to every distributor and say, hey, I've got a rom-com, because that's not what they do. Yeah. Certain distributors only do a particular genre. So that's not how the market works, and you've got to find and say, okay, this is the genre of my film, and this is the best distributor, this is the best sales agent that's going to go out there and base basically be able to, you know, package and, and sell my product. It's the, the, but you can't, there's no way you can please everyone. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the first mistake you make is trying to please everyone. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Katarina's idealism, I hope, will. 
I hope is the way things happen. That actually the garden just gets more bountiful mm -hmm. and we can use, and then with this plethora of subjects, but then you, uh, it's like what Timber says with the marketing, you have to then be very specific. And in, in today's modern world, you can target that, that person in Kwamashu who will want to see your film and will, will pay you 10 rand on video demand at the taxi rate, let's say, for example. So, so, so yeah, I'm excited too. <laughs> and, and one way of making, telling good stories is obviously also to not try to, to think in terms of formulas so or what worked before, yeah. who did the what, how, but <laughs> actually authentic storytelling, tell the story you want to tell, whether it's a rom-com, whether it's an auto movie, whatever it is, but like yeah, an authentic story that. rather yes. than again trying to, there, there are no formulas that are guaranteed to work. You said earlier that there's no set formula, but clearly Afrikaans mm. films, they're drawing an audience and there seems to be a growth and explosion in Afrikaans cinema. Can you touch on that, Andrew? Look, Afrikaans cinema has always been strong in this country. Uh, the original state subsidy, which was uh, it, uh, Jamie Ace made the nationalist government uh, set it up, and that was biased in terms of African cinema. So, you know, African cinema has always been strong, okay? And they've always supported their stars. They have had a star system. And because it's a marginalized culture, I guess, they, and they've got money, they go to shopping malls, which is the cinema, the equivalent of the cinema. I think that they, a lot of the films they do are, seem repetitive to me. Um, but, you know, you've got a film like Pariahs, which uh, Temba produced, um, which is a, a really brave uh, Afrikaans film about the history. And, it, it, you know, it's a strong, dramatic movie. The disposable income, they want to support their culture. You know, so you, you'll find that also Afrikaans movies, the DVDs sell very well. Um, and also broadcasters. Um, so African cinema also benefits from CakeNet, which has got money, it's cash rich, and if you make a movie, they're sure to pick it up and they will put up money. So you've got the DTI money, you've got CakeNet, you can make a movie. What do you think um, the stories we should be telling, what, what should they be? Let's start with you. Uh, I don't believe in prescribing stories. Okay. <laughs> i tell you what I do think though, uh, having gone to film festivals quite a lot over the last year and a half as a filmmaker and as a jury member, I do think that we are still in South Africa too inspired by American and, and old-fashioned European tropes, you know, uh, in terms of story structures and stuff like that. And you're exposed when you go to film festivals in Egypt and Morocco and uh, Korea and India, you see stories that are so that could happen here, but somehow we wouldn't think of them. Like there's a movie called The Lunchbox set in Mumbai. And it's about a, a woman who's trapped in a loveless marriage and a guy who's a widower. And in Mumbai, they deliver lunchboxes every day. It's a huge big thing. And the lunchbox goes to the wrong person. And it's a love story. And it's very, very simple. And you learn about Mumbai. And it's wonderful. And that you can do. And you where, can do where, that, yeah. Where stories are not prescribed. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. you don't prescribe. I think what they're saying is that yeah. there's, there's cultural nuances, there's so much diversity here, and this goes back to what Katharina was, Katarina was saying, is that you need to look at the diversity, and there are pearls in there. Mm. And those pearls you can pick up, or you can polish, and you can give to the world. And they'll be universal, and actually. Be, absolutely. I mean, Brazilian cinema was, 10 years ago, was struggling. Uh, but it got an incentive from the government because the producers and the filmmakers got together and lobbied government. And now they're making well over 100 films a year and growing because also at the same time the infrastructure has grown with regards to distribution as well and the amount of um, screens that have been uh, 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 spouting all over the country as well. And you look at the Brazil Brazilian population, there's a, a similarity in the history of its cinema is almost as old as South Africa's. The cultural diversity as well, uh, the fact that there's a, you know, the diaspora of the African people there and European as well. So, and they've been able to, to exploit that. South African can do the same thing. So, like yet once again, not to prescribe, there's so many stories to be told, unique stories to be told. The incentives that have been put forth have given us such a great opportunity right now. We need to make sure we exploit that opportunity to grow the industry and to tell our stories. And I do, I do also think that like 10 years ago or whatever, 
maybe more than that, when the NAPF first started and all that, you know, we were all very excited and everything. It seemed that every story had to have some kind of political backbone or had to be politically correct or had to be about the past or had to be about reclaiming legacies or the, the, the heroes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's healthy that we've gone beyond that. And so the hero in the story can be the little kid trying to get a soccer ball or whatever, you know, and I'm prescribing it, or whatever, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's about, you know, it's about going to the movies. Mm. It's not about, about reliving the TRC or watching the news or, or to know. do that, if it, that is what well, the filmmaker wants to do. That, yeah. yeah, but yeah. I think also but the same time. But have a good time, time in the cinema. Yeah. Well, yeah. Also at the, the same time, we, we, we also have to have a sense of like knowing what our history is mm. so we yes. can understand yes. ourselves. Yes. I'm not going to go and tell a Jewish person to stop making movies about mm. the Nazis in occupation over no 65 years yeah. ago. Sure. Yeah. No one does, because mm. nobody prescribes to them and say, listen, mm. you should stop making these movies about concentration mm. camps. Yeah. I didn't tell those people that were making Farai, I say, hey, you want to make a film about what? I was like, wow, this is compelling because as much as there, it's Afrikaans, it's about the complexity and the tapestry of our history because yes. it's intertwined, mm. you understand? Yeah. So I think that's important. Andrew's got a point is that we need to get beyond that. It's great that we've got rom-coms and light movies. We need that. We need that diversity. It actually comes down to what Katerina said. Yeah. Yeah. Tell the story you, that's inside yes. you that you want to tell. When you're sitting down at the dinner table and you say, hey, I want to tell you the story, yeah. that's the kind of feeling you're going to mm. have.